Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm really happy to have you with us. Um, there are still a few people coming in, but we'll we'll make a start. Um, my name is Cameron Allen um, with Professor Lucy Montgomery. I'm co-lead of the Curtin Open Knowledge Initiative and really happy to be bringing you um, this webinar about the future of rankings in an open data world in collaboration uh, with Future Campus. Um, I'm coming to you from the unceded lands of the Wadjuk Noongar people um, here in Perth, Western Australia. I'd like to acknowledge um, the elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that many people coming from different parts of this country and beyond and recognize the elders and indigenous peoples uh, of those spaces and places. And to reflect that, when it comes to thinking about the impact of knowledge and knowledge creation, that there are traces around me in the place I'm privileged enough to be sitting in um, that have been lasting for tens of thousands of years, uh, not merely the incursions of the last 200. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Tim Winkler from Future Campus, who's going to guide us um, through the discussion process. Um, we'll set that off and then we will get on to the speakers. So, Tim. Thanks very much, Cameron. It's uh, awesome to be here and to have such an interesting topic and also such, uh, uh, such great talent from uh, the other side of the world very, very early in the morning. Ludo and Lizzie will introduce you in a moment, but thank you in advance from me and the rest of us. Cameron, I want to start things off um, having a quick chat about um, rankings and their importance in Australia. Um, they, it, rankings have been really critical, particularly over the last two decades, both in terms of um, brand and perhaps sometimes secondarily to re research evaluation. Why invest time in developing yet another ranking system? So I think, I mean, the Australian sector is very much in flux. And as we're waiting for the results of the Accord review, um, the SHIELD review uh, and the ACOLA report uh, for the chief scientist last, last year, we're seeing uh, Australia really become aware of the big shifts in terms of thinking about what university is for and how evaluation systems need to change uh, in general. So I think the opportunities we're gonna hear about today in this new world um, with open data, greater transparency, greater reproducibility, those are really underpinning things that will help us address um, the interests of government, society, and our own needs to really engage in equity and inclusion and how that affects the way we think about the qualities of research in the future. Well, which I guess links nicely to the the uh, issue on everybody's uh, brains at the moment, apart from AI, which is the accord. Um, no conversation about Australian universities or within Australian universities can occur much without thinking about what the accord will bring. Uh, do you think new approaches to rankings are going to be important as part of the accord? I think it's going to be critical. I mean, obviously, we don't know what's in the report yet. We don't know what the government's response um, is going to look like. But if you look at the interim report um, and also read the tea leaves um, as things are shifting in this country, interesting report in um, Sydney Morning Herald today about inclusion and equity and, and challenges there. It's very clear, and the minister's made this clear, that... Um, the roles of universities need to be seen more holistically. Um, there needs to be more flexibility in reporting on what we're achieving, not just in research, but also across the teaching engagement um, and wider impacts agendas. Um, so I think it's going to be critical. It's been particularly critical because we need to demonstrate impact to the Australian government in the Australian context. And so we need the flexibility and agility that control over this data can provide. So we can report on the things that matter here and we can shape our discussions in terms of the things that matter in the Australian context, rather than what's being set um, by international and largely opaque data sources. Uh, so, uh, you know, mention uh, opaque data sources. Is the reproducibility and the transparency of this sort of approach going to be important not to convince not just 
the government, but also the public. We've seen a decline in esteem for universities measured um, over the last uh, couple of years. Do you think there's a chance this might rebuild trust? I really hope so. That's a obviously that's a big challenge. Um, the the processes of disinformation through the pandemic and other issues. Um, transparency is critical. It's not enough, um, but it's at least a, a start. Um, and the expectations are going to be very high, I think. Um, so I think it's really critical um, to when we talk about how we make knowledge um, and who it's for and who's engaged and who's involved, um, that we make it as accessible as possible, as transparent as possible, um, while not forgetting that the translation into the settings where it gets used is also a critical, um, critically important part of the story. Um, so no, it's not the whole story. It's not going to solve all of the problems of trust and disinformation, but at least it provides a platform for us to um, address that work on the other things. And finally, just before we uh, we move on, um, is there a chance that this sort of approach could uh, reduce the burden of labour for universities? What, what, it seems these approaches and the work you're doing over at Koki uh, has the potential to significantly reduce a lot of that grunt work that has to happen in research offices to get the data and process it and push it through in an acceptable form to government. W what's stopping us from moving to a more efficient system right now? Yeah, absolutely. Well, very little is stopping us in terms of the technical capacity um, and the systems that are available. Um, it's more about the traditions and expectations that have developed over really only the last 10 or 20 years, to be honest. Um, with respect to rankings and the data sources that are traditionally used. So I think there are two layers to this, um, and they're both really important. Um, there are real opportunities for automation. Um, the ERA process was incredibly labor intensive, incredibly manual. The opportunities for automating large chunks of the data collection, not the review, but the data collection are huge. Um, and we've demonstrated that in the modeling work we did for both the benchmarks and more recently in actually modeling what the era 23 exercise would have looked like. Um, but more than that, I think the real opportunity is in the work that is already being done to curate and correct uh, issues and mistakes uh, in the data that has been being used. The labor that is being dedicated there, which could be used to create better and create and curate better data sources that everyone can use, that everyone benefits from. Um, I think that's got huge potential. Um, if you just think about it, the costs for say a company to clean and prepare data, do that centrally is are really, really high. And it's really, really hard to do that in a way that's globally comprehensive. But each institution has a really clear idea of what they've done, what's there, what's missing. And so if we collectively work on that, then the, the labor for any given organization is relatively small, but the benefits accrue to everyone. And I think that's, for me at least, that's the really exciting part um, of what's emerging out of these changes um, that are coming, coming along at the moment. So I think that probably places us at a good time to then dive further into what's going on at CWTS and then some thoughts uh, uh, from Lizzie also on, on what's going on there. Cameron, do you want to lead the way so as we dive a bit deeper into the detail? Yeah, I would love to. Um, so our two speakers today, um, the cliche of not needing any introduction um, certainly applies, but I'm going to take the privilege of doing so anyway. Um, because I wanted to explain why we brought um, this group together and explain why I think these are two of the most important voices um, in this conversation internationally. Um, so I will introduce each of them in, in turn as we as we go through the talks. We'll start with Professor Ludo Waltman, um, who's Director um, at the Centre for Science and Technology Studies, CWTS at Leiden, architect um, and manager of the Leiden Ranking, um, and really someone who is known internationally as a person who brings incredible um, rigor and method, attention to methodological detail um, to questions of, of research evaluation and strategic assessment. Um, and also 
um, doesn't shy away from the challenging issues, the difficult, the difficult discussions. Um, but if you ever have a question about whether what you've done is right, um, or whether there's a mistake in your reasoning or a mistake in your analysis, uh, Ludo is the person you want to talk to. Uh, just be prepared to get the answer. Um, and so his leadership in terms of what evaluation systems should look like, what those methodologies should look like, I think is really important um, to take account of um, as these changes occur. And I think the, the changes and initiatives coming out of CWTS um, are really exciting. So with no further ado, uh, rambling from me, um, Ludo, really keen to hear what you've got to say. Thank you very much, Cameron. Um, it's great to be here. Thank you for the uh, invitation. Um, I will uh, share with you some uh, some updates about work that we are doing uh, at my center, the Center for Science and Technology Studies at, at, at Leiden University. It's really great that you've all um, uh, shown up in this, in, this, in this webinar to actually um, have this discussion about university rankings, about the data that we work with, the importance of transparency. Um, let me actually first share my screen. So what I will do in the next 20 minutes or so is I will introduce you uh, to the um, open edition of the CWTS Leiden ranking. Uh, so the Leiden ranking, as you may know, is a ranking system that is uh, in existence now for about 15 years. And so it has a substantial history. It started uh, around 2007 uh, by my center, by the Center for Science and Technology Studies at, at Leiden University. The ranking has evolved a lot over time. We learned a lot um, by producing this ranking, by getting feedback, by benefiting from all kinds of, 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 of feedback and sometimes also criticism that we got. Um, and we are now reaching a kind of a new milestone in the development of this ranking. And this new milestone is the open edition that I will uh, briefly tell you about. I will also try to provide a little bit of context around around this, this, this open edition, because it is actually part of uh, of a bigger development, a bigger development in terms of a movement, a movement towards openness of, of, of research information. Um, and I would like to offer some reflection on that, that bigger, that bigger movement that is at the moment uh, taking place and that I consider to be really essential in, in, the, in the landscape of, of research analytics, research intelligence. Um, there are, of course, also all kinds of discussions about university rankings in general, beyond the specific ranking that uh, my organization is producing. I won't go into uh, full detail on, on all of that, although I do want to make a few comments on um, culture change around university rankings that is currently uh, taking place in my country, in the Netherlands. And that's actually also what I will start with. Um, so in the Netherlands, uh, the universities, so we have certain universities in the Netherlands, the universities, uh, like many other countries, have been playing the ranking game. So you, of course, all know the rules of the game. You are being ranked, and um, you appear somewhere in these ranking tables, um, and you can make use of this ranking position in all kinds of ways, especially, of course, if you are being ranked at a high position. That's a way to kind of present yourself as a um, well-performing university, a university that might be an attractive place to study, for instance, for students. Um, so this is an attractive way to actually market, advertise your university. And that's also what the Dutch universities were um, often doing. So they used the rankings to indeed um, um, show their strengths, or at least to make claims about their strengths, um, hoping that this would also kind of put them in a stronger position in a competitive landscape, especially competitive in terms of uh, attracting students. What is happening at the moment in the Netherlands is um, a major development. So the universities have realized that the way in which within the universities um, researchers or more generally academics are being recognized and rewarded for um, all the things they do needs um, considerable change and reform. Um, so traditionally, like in many countries, 
bibliometric parameters that play an important role. So the amount of publications you have, the number of citations these publications bear, perhaps also measures funding that you acquire. These types of parameters have often, not always, but often played an important role in the way researchers are being recognized and rewarded. And that's, of course, similar to the way in which some university rankings, in particular university rankings that um, have a major influence on the research system, the way in which they kind of create incentives and the way they emphasize particular aspects of, of research performance, like publications, citations, etc. And the universities and analysts have realized that actually we need to move away from this system because it has lots of problems. It reduces being an academic at a Dutch university to something that's very narrow, just publishing articles, making sure these articles get cited. And research is, and research should be so much more than just that. And um, the universities also recognize that it's actually really difficult to make that change if the universities themselves are still subject to outside uh, incentive systems, like the university rankings, that keep emphasizing these traditional parameters, like publications and publications. So the universities in the Netherlands asked a number of experts, I was one of them, to provide um, an advice to the universities on how to deal with this difficult challenge. On the one hand, you want to reform things, but at the same time, you feel like the outside world is imposing on us a certain way of working, a certain way of thinking. And the outside world in particular then is the university rankings. Um, so what we did is we proposed to the universities in the Netherlands, we proposed a strategy for culture change around university rankings. So we made the point that indeed there is an important tension between all the ambitions, the aspirations that those universities have to change the way we do recognition and reward of academics. And on the other hand, the way the universities deal with rankings, there's a tension there. We also recognized that um, there are no easy solutions because the rankings indeed do make sense, uh, do make a difference in certain ways. They do indeed, for instance, uh, influence uh, students that may uh, may or may not um, um, study at Dutch universities or perhaps even academics that may decide or decide not to move to Dutch universities. So yes, the rankings in some sense are indeed a reality that the universities need to take into account. Um, we have also made the point very clearly that uh, many ranking systems are flawed, flawed in all kinds of ways. In particular, ranking systems are flawed um, when they reduce the performance of universities to just one single dimension, one single dimension that is supposed to capture everything, everything universities do. And one single dimension that is essentially creating a one size fits all way of thinking in which everyone, all universities globally are expected to do the same thing and to perform in the same way. So that's the point we made. In terms of solutions, we propose this culture change where we recognize that culture change is complex, difficult, cannot happen overnight, requires collaboration at the national level, but also beyond the national level, so internationally. The table at the right here shows the um, strategy that we propose. So we propose to work on um, in the short term, on uh, changes in the way in which individual universities, individual institutions deal with rankings. This is kind of the low hanging fruit. Any university could just do this and should, in our view, uh, start working on this. But then we recognize that many things kind of are risky. Many things cannot really be done by individual universities, or at least you cannot really expect universities to do that. But if there is a possibility to coordinate at a national level in the Netherlands, then we make the argument the university should, should do this and should work together on certain aspects of culture change. And then ideally, the most ambitious ways in which you can change culture around university rankings is uh, at the international level, could be the European level, but even better, of course, at the global level. And at that level, what we are proposing is that if universities manage to need to join forces, they could jointly take really ambitious, bold steps to change the way in which they relate to the university rankings, which might even entail actually discontinuing these, these, these relationships. Um, I won't go into the details of what all these, all these uh, elements of the culture change agenda, what they are about. Um, there's actually a report available online that gives the full details. It's, it's, it's in English. So it's also available for uh, international readers. Um, just one thing I do want to emphasize that in the short term, at the institutional level, what we emphasize is um, that uh, um, in the way institutions work together with, with league tables, 
So that's the, the third column over here. Um, there is a need for more transparency. So if your university decides to participate in the university rankings, if you decide indeed to do that, despite all kinds of uh, limitations, problems that, that, that these rankings often have, then at least we make the argument, make sure that any data that you provide to these rankings is shared openly. So don't share it just only privately with these rankings, but make it openly available so that we create transparency around all the data that is being shared with ranking agencies and also so that we create accountability so people organizations can actually see each other's data check each other's data etc at the same time of course this also provides more space for for having new actors that actually make use of all this information and that perhaps make could make use of this information in better ways than the uh, the dominant ranking agencies are doing at the moment um also one thing i want to mention and is um, that in the longer term, um, what we propose as part of this idea of joining forces at the international level, what we propose is also a particular philosophy on what could be alternatives to league tables. So in the rightmost column over here. So we are recognizing that it's kind of unrealistic to have a world without rankings. We may wish to have such a world, but it's unrealistic because anyone can always make a ranking. You cannot really tell people that they cannot do it, so people will keep doing that, organizations will keep doing that, but what we should strive for is to have different types of, 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 of rankings. So moving away from non-transparent black box league tables, league tables that reduce everything to one single dimension, and trying to come up with open multidimensional alternatives. So multidimensional means paying attention to different aspects of what universities are doing, and enabling users of your ranking tool to actually decide themselves what matters to them, what they feel is important. And you could imagine that students, for instance, may have interests that are completely different from the interests of an academic that is considering to move to a new university. Um, we also emphasize the importance of these new types of, of, of ranking tools to be fully open and transparent. And that's important, we argue, First of all, because it, it, this, 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 it creates accountability, reproducibility, all these important things. It's also important because it means that um, what you present to users is not just one, uh, one single number, a number that no one really understands. What you actually present is numbers that provide access to a much uh, richer uh, source of data that people could actually make use of in all kinds of ways to interpret the numbers in a deeper way, to reflect much more deeply on what the numbers could mean, or perhaps even to create their own alternative ways of turning all the data into analytics. Um, and that should offer an opportunity to and to deal much more responsibly with, with rankings and actually with research analytics in general. So that was the argument that we made to the Dutch universities, and the Dutch universities have endorsed these recommendations and this agenda for to change at the moment uh, the implementation is ongoing in the Netherlands um, and I expect that uh, in the coming months there will be announcements from Dutch universities about the steps they are taking in the implementation process and at the same time the Dutch universities are also um, coordinating an international conversation at least at the moment a conversation at the European level in which um, um, possibilities for joining forces uh, internationally are being are being discussed. So hopefully this culture change agenda can be actually extended to at least the European level or even beyond, like also your country, Australia. Um, so that's what happened in, in, in my country, the Netherlands. And in particular, what is very relevant for the thing I would like to share with you today is this um, idea of moving towards open multidimensional alternatives to league tables. So that brings us to openness of research information. I will very quickly go through a few uh, developments that are ongoing, just to provide context for the thing that my team um, is working on at the moment, the open edition of the Leiden ranking. So what we see is an increasing awareness that whenever we work with research analytics, it's important that we are in control of the data that we use, the infrastructure that we use, um, instead of having um, um, actors, typically companies, proprietary uh, uh, infrastructure providers, these actors being in control of our data and ultimately therefore also being in control of all kinds of indicators and metrics that we use to make decisions. So the uh, Coalition for Advancing uh, Research Assessment, which is a major initiative primarily in Europe, although it's actually a global initiative, and 
Uh, Lisa Gert is actually playing an important role in this. This coalition, which now has about 600 members, 600 members like this, many universities, this coalition is actually emphasizing the importance of independence and transparency of data infrastructure and, and criteria for research assessment um, and, and, and more broadly, I would say, for kind of research analytics. Um, and the work that I'm going to present today is very much based on this idea, that indeed, that independence and transparency is really essential. The good thing is that there are all kinds of organizations, like the ones on this slide, that are actually helping us to um, um, indeed have access to research information, for instance, information about publications, uh, but also about other research outputs, information that is fully open. So these organizations are doing great work to make that type of information openly available. There are more, but these are four prominent examples of such organizations. And my center, for instance, is very much actually dependent on the great work as organizations like those are, are doing. Uh, what you also see is that there are already several really successful and important initiatives that make use of open research information and turn that information into um, analytics that are actually being used for all kinds of, of, of purposes and being used in ways that I would really say are beneficial for the research system. In France, there's the French Open Science Monitor, a monitor of open science of adoption that is based fully on open data. Um, uh, Cameron and Lucy, uh, the, the Curtin Open Knowledge Initiative, they have built their uh, open access dashboards, another initiative that I really uh, admire, also fully based on open data. Uh, in the Netherlands, our national funder recently announced that they are going to do open access monitoring exclusively based on open data. Again, great development, I think. Um, so here we see that we do not only have that data in the, the, the infrastructures that I showed on the previous slide, but we also see more and more that this data is actually being used um, and being used for all kinds of really important uh, uh, purposes. Um, my center has a long history, a history of, of more than uh, 30 years in doing uh, bibliometric analysis, scientometric analysis. Um, so we were actually one of the, the pioneering institutions in this, in this domain. And we are proud of all the work we have done, um, but we also need to recognize that our work has always been based on data, bibliometric data that uh, was of a proprietary close nature, which always felt a bit uneasy. Um, and the good thing is that we now have the opportunity to move away from that um, 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 situation. So we are at the moment uh, transitioning to fully open research information. Yesterday we published this blog post in which we explain in more detail what we are doing. But in the next few years, my center will fully move away from the use of closed proprietary data sources, and we will uh, adopt open research information as the default in our way of working. And we hope, of course, that many other organizations will follow us, just like we are following others that um, have actually taken the lead in this, in this space. Um, and the open edition of the Leiden ranking is um, an example of um, um, what we are uh, going to do and what we have already started to do. So the Leiden ranking, um, as I already mentioned, was established about 15 years ago. This is the most recent edition from 2023. It's a ranking that, uh, unlike the universal rankings like Times Higher Education, like US, like the Shanghai ranking and a number of others, this ranking is not does not provide one single composite indicator that is supposed to capture everything. It's a multidimensional ranking. It's up to the users to decide what they are interested in. This ranking also doesn't claim that it gives you information about all aspects of the performance of universities. We try to be most. Our ranking is a ranking that's based exclusively on bibliometric data. Therefore, we can make statements. We can provide information only about certain aspects of the performance of universities. It's only about research and only, when you, and also when you look at research, it's only about certain aspects of of the research universities are doing. So many things are not visible in the, in the Leiden ranking, and that's something we really feel is always essential to acknowledge. The Leiden ranking is based on Web of Science data. So data from Clarifate um, is enriched by CWTS, but uh, from the start of the ranking in, in around 2007, the ranking has always been based on Web of Science data. My center has put a lot of effort in, in kind of working with the data, making the enrichments. We are proud of the work we have done. Um, but we also feel it's time to uh, move on to a new way of doing this and a more transparent way of doing this. So a few years ago in 2017, we uh, introduced 10 rules for ranking universities, kind of uh, good practices. Um, and one of these was be transparent. 
And actually, we had to acknowledge ourselves that we failed to meet that, that, that principle. So these 10 principles, there was one, the transparency principle that we did not fully meet ourselves, which of course is painful to, to acknowledge, but that was the conclusion we had to draw, given the fact that our ranking was based on closed data, could not be reproduced, uh, and, 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 and we could only offer limited transparency to the usage of our ranking. Um, last year, when we released the, the 2023 uh, ranking based on the science data, we announced that we were going to move to a new way of doing this, based on open data, creating a fully transparent uh, uh, edition of the LIDAR ranking. So this announcement actually got quite a lot of attention in a number of European countries, for instance. Uh, France is an example. There was a lot of interest in this announcement. Um, so it led to lots of interesting discussions, actually, and, and, and people approaching us with all kinds of, 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 of requests for more information or even proposals for working together. Um, right now, where are we? We are going to release the open edition of the Leiden ranking on January 30, so in about one and a half week, which is exciting. This will be based on data from Open Alex. So Open Alex is our data source. It's an open alternative to databases like Web of Science, but also other people's focus. Um, we are going to work with that database, Open Alex. Um, we see this as an experiment. So starting to work with a new data source, a data source is actually still in a relatively early stage of development. That is, by definition, something that we feel should be uh, seen as an experiment. We cannot immediately expect this to be kind of the perfect thing. It's really a huge effort to move to such a new data source, and we want to make sure that in the end we get everything uh, perfectly uh, correct in the way we do all the analysis. But this is a process where we also need to learn and we need feedback and we need to have conversations with the community. So what we do right now, we will release the first open edition of the Leiden ranking as an experiment that will hopefully lead to further conversations, discussions, feedback. And then we expect that very soon this open edition of the Leiden ranking will reach full maturity and will be a full replacement to the traditional closed uh, Leiden ranking. I also want to acknowledge the partners that we are working with, uh, Koki, uh, including Open Knowledge Initiatives, our research, the producer of Open Alex, and also uh, Sesame Open Science. Um, so this is a scatter plot that shows kind of differences between the old line ranking based on Web of Science data, the new one, Open Alex. In general, you can say things are highly correlated. Of course, there are differences. They tend to be relatively small, which I would say is actually evidence of the fact that these data sources like Open Alex are already getting more and more mature. This is Australia. This is uh, not the final data. This is something that is close to final, but um, I just want to give you an impression of basically what you can expect, but the, the final picture is likely to be a little bit different. But what you see is, again, a strong correlation. This is percentage of highly cited publication of universities, strong correlation between Web of Science-based statistics and Open Alex-based statistics. People have asked us lots of questions about data quality. Is the data of the open edition of the same quality as the traditional Leiden ranking? That's a very complex question. Lots of things can be said about it. And uh, we did extensive in-depth analysis. We will also publish about that. Uh, at the time of the release, we will be very transparent about data quality. But basically, the bottom line is that in terms of data quality, we are getting really close to the quality that we could offer with the traditional Leiden ranking. Uh, these graphs show comparisons, they show to what extent the same publications are assigned to universities. It's all quite complex, I won't go into the details, but we're getting really, really close. For some universities, there are still uh, substantial discrepancies, but for the large majority of the universities, the differences are really small, or I would even say they're tiny. Um, one more thing. For us, this is all part of a bigger development, a bigger transition to open research information. And this is something that we, my center, we cannot do on our own. We need to do that with the community at large. We hope to do that, for instance, with lots of universities that want to be part of it. We work together with the Koki team. Uh, one thing that's going to happen is a uh, declaration on open research information is going to be released later this year. Um, and in the declaration, um, um, organizations that, that sign the declaration can also um, um, indicate their commitment to open research information. So, yes, making open research information the default, like, for instance, my center is at the moment uh, working on uh, making use of services and systems that need support open research information, thinking about how to support infrastructures that enable open research information, uh, taking collective action uh, instead of each of us trying to do this transition individually. These are the types of ideas that will be promoted in that, in that declaration. 
Um, so I just want to mention that to show that actually this is all part of a bigger development. Also, of course, to signal that perhaps some of you might be interested or your organizations might be interested to join this movement, and perhaps even to sign this declaration, like I expect also many uh, European universities will, will do. And if that is the case, then don't hesitate to reach out to me or to the Koki colleagues, because we are happy to have uh, some further discussion with you about all these developments. Some universities in Europe are actually already taking action. This is Sorbonne University in Paris. They already decided that they need to move to open research information. They have unsubscribed from Web of Science. It's an announcement they made um, uh, at the end of uh, 2023. Um, uh, last week, CNRS, huge research organization in France, they also said we need to move to open research information. They decided to cancel their scope of subscription. They also announced that Web of Science is something they will at some point also uh, discontinue, although they say it's a bit too early to, to do this right now, but in the end, we are going to make the full transition to open research information. So a lot is already happening, a lot is already going on, and I'm really proud that also my center, CWTS, um, can be part of this, this development, and I hope uh, that many other organizations will also join this movement. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ludo. Um, really exciting to see and, and very, very glad to be working with you on some of these things. Um, I'm going to propose we move on to our second speaker. Um, I will say, I, I know I said in the email just before the, the session that you should use the Q&A facility, and I failed to remember this was a webinar, not a Zoom meeting. So if you do have questions, feel free to stick them in the chat. I can see that Eva Mendez has already done that, um, and we'll come back to those at the end. Um, but I'm really happy um, to introduce uh, Lizzie Gad. Dr. Elizabeth Gad is the uh, Head of Culture and Assessment at Loughborough University a vice chair of COARA, the Coalition of uh, Coalition for the Advancement of Research Assessment. I can't remember the names. Um, and uh, as well as being um, the chair of the Research Evaluation Working Group um, of the International Network of Research Management Societies. Um, Lizzie has been at the center of critical debates around research evaluation and rankings um, for many years in a number of uh, roles, as you can as you can tell, and in particular, um, she has brought this incredible sense of clarity and principles um, to these questions, um, holding many of us to account on the details of what we said we were doing and whether we were really doing it, um, but also from the experience and the pragmatic realities of working within a university uh, where the real world needs to be grappled with. Um, so. Real pleasure to have you here um, and look forward to hearing what you've got to say, Liz. Thank you so much, Cameron, and uh, thank you all for, for being here. I'm just going to share my screen and to make that full size, if I can. Brilliant. I'm hoping you can see that okay. So, so yes, a very good morning to you all. Um, as Cameron said, I work um, both for the uh, International Network of Research Management Society's Research Evaluation Group and uh, also for the Coalition on Advancing Research Assessment. And both of these groups really care very deeply um, <clears throat> about some of the negative impacts of university rankings. So my mission today, um, <clears throat> excuse me, early morning cough, um, it is quite simple, and that's to, to answer this question, uh, university rankings, what is the problem uh, and what can we do about it? Um, so rankings have been around for, for over a century, but it's only really been since the 1980s that we've seen a significant rise in both uh, the volume and the range of national and international uh, university rankings, uh, with, as I'm sure you're all aware, three rising to particular dominance. Uh, that's the times uh, sorry, the QS World University Rankings, uh, the Times Higher Education uh, World University Rankings, and the Shanghai uh, Academic Ranking of World Universities, are we? Uh, so whilst it, it, it might be seen to be helpful to have this range of alternative uh, rankings rising up to, bride, to provide a broader perspective on university quality, I think it's true to say that whilst this triopoly uh, exists, the influence of other actors is might not be as strong as we would like it to be. Um, but but so what? You know, aren't these just harmless curiosities, something to browse at the breakfast table? Well, unfortunately, they're not uh, just that. Uh, university rankings have a significant impact 
on all actors in the higher education sector. So uh, governments, as you may be aware, all over the world uh, are investing in so-called excellence initiatives uh, that seek not necessarily to improve um, the quality of their education or to push back the boundaries of knowledge, but to increase their chances of getting a number of universities into those upper echelons of the global university rankings. So uh, some countries have merged a number of smaller institutions to create larger universities with a view to having a bigger impact on the university rankings. No other real ostensible region, so Paris Saclay and University of Adelaide, uh, I'm sure you're very familiar with, uh, are two examples. The Universities of Western Australia are currently thinking about doing the same, uh, as are um, universities in Romania. In the UK, uh, the government are using the global rankings to decide who qualifies for a new visa called uh, for, for high potential individuals, the high potential individual uh, visa. Uh, and these high potential individuals are identified solely by virtue of having attended a university which appears in the top 50 of at least two of the big three university rankings. And I'll show you the impact of that in, in a moment. Not surprisingly, then, uh, students then seek to study in these highly ranked institutions, which has led many universities, um, uh, financial stability being significantly affected uh, by their rank. Consequently, uh, institutions all over the world are investing resources and appointing staff uh, just to enable them to do better in the ranking. So this is not about improving uh, their educational offer or the quality of their research. This is about improving in the rankings. Um, but unfortunately, the stakes are so high that efforts don't stop at legitimate activity, but at best gaming the system, such as encouraging positive responses to reputation surveys, and at worst cheating, uh, so paying highly cited scholars from other universities to add your institution as a secondary affiliation, uh, thus boosting their citation rates and their ranking chances. So we can see that the rankings exert a trickle down effect on government behaviour, funder behaviour, uh, university behaviour, and of course, ultimately, uh, on the behaviour of individual students and researchers, both as their value is wrongly judged uh, by the institutions that they studied uh, and worked at, but also by the pressures on them to, uh, by their institutions to engage in ranking climbing rather than genuinely scholarly activity. So it's for this reason, um, as Ludo has mentioned, that the, the Coalition on Advancing Research Assessment has as one of its four core commitments avoiding the use of rankings of research organisations in research and researcher assessment. But it's not just the trickle down effects that are exerted by the rankings, but the systemic uh, effects, and I'll expand on this in a moment, but by setting the standard for what good looks like, uh, rankings simply maintain the status quo, concentrating uh, power and prestige in a small group of similar looking organisations in the global north, encouraging greater homogeneity amongst institutions rather than the diversity and the innovation uh, that we need, driving competition rather than collaboration making losers out of everyone uh, effectively, uh, perpetuating the myth that when it comes to higher education, there can only be one winner, one institution that really does it right. But you might be thinking, well, surely universities should be accountable, right? We can't expect to avoid scrutiny. And of course, the answer is yes. Um, but accountable to whom would be my question, you know, because the rankings themselves are unappointed and unaccountable. Uh, indeed, as Professor Stephen Curry, uh, Chair of the Declaration on Research Assessment, or former Declaration uh, uh, Chair, I should say, uh, he succinctly put it on Twitter recently, um, if you need a league table to tell you what matters, are you really a university? And if we're using this data to support our own decision making as institutions, perhaps we should be doing some due diligence of our own uh, and, and ask, uh, I think, three questions, namely, um, are they true? Are they fair? Uh, and if not, what can we do about it? So in terms of the first question, are they true? Um, because universities are truth seekers, after all, you know, we, we hold ourselves to the highest standards of rigour in our own research, so we wouldn't want to kind of lend legitimacy to something that was patently uh, untrue. 
So if we tackled this like a research proposal and looked at the research question posed by the rankings, namely, which is the best university in the world, we'd quickly realise that this was a badly formed research question. Best at what? You know, assuming you did get it past your supervisor, you still then need some agreement as to what a top university looks like. And you'd soon realise that there is no one definition um, because universities are not a homogenous group. They are hugely varied and complex entities working in hugely different uh, environments and contexts. And even those activities which are common to most universities, such as teaching, research and some form of knowledge transfer or impact, uh, are not always covered by the main university rankings. Assuming we let that pass, um, we should at least expect that the indicators would have some face validity for the concepts being measured. Uh, but alas, that's not what we have. Uh, so here are the indicators used by the Academic Ranking of World Universities, where they seek to measure education quality and staff quality by the number of alumni or staff winning Nobel Prizes or Fields Medals. Uh, and of course, the idea that only research output uh, that counts is published in Nature and Science is, is risible. And of course, the data uh, on which the rankings relies is also questionable, as, and um, Ludo's already started to explore some of this, uh, not least because much of it um, in the big rankings is supplied by universities and is unverifiable. Unless, of course, a whistleblower calls it out, which was the case with the University of Columbia uh, a couple of years ago, where their ranking plummeted after uh, Professor Michael Thaddeus exposed much of the data they'd submitted to uh, the US News ranking as being false. And of course, the surveys used by many of these rankings are deeply problematic. Neither are their indicators uh, sensitive to the intrinsic inertia of institutions that, that are being measured. Uh, given that universities are large, slow moving organisations, we shouldn't, shouldn't see significant rises uh, in their rank in a single year. Uh, but of course we do. Uh, as Jelena Brankovic recently pointed out in this blog post where she describes a 120 place rise for Bielefeld University over two years uh, due to one scholar, one scholar contributing to the global burden of disease study, uh, leading to hyper authored, highly cited papers published in The Lancet. But of course, as scholars, we know that no study is perfect and it's our duty to report the limitations and the uncertainty inherent in our findings. Uh, so to this end, the CWTS Leiden ranking Ludo has introduced uh, publishes stability intervals alongside some of their data, which puts a question mark over many of the ranking positions. But no other ranking does this and certainly not uh, the, the big three, uh, where the use of composite indicators uh, and poor survey approaches would almost certainly uh, render the rankings completely meaningless because the data is just not reliable enough to say that institution is definitively better than that institution. Uh, so the second big area of concern about the rankings is, uh, to me, around their uh, equity and diversity and inclusion aspects, namely, are they fair? And of course, if they're not true, they're almost certainly not fair uh, because they're not rewarding necessarily the right institutions. But there are other darker sides to this inequity. Uh, so various studies have concluded that the winners in uh, global university rankings are always the old, large, wealthy, uh, research intensive, science focused, English speaking institutions in the global north. Uh, and of course, no matter how many excellence initiatives uh, you fund, you can't change your age or your geography. And one of the things that uh, exacerbates this, um, as again Ludo has mentioned, is the heavy use of bibliometric data uh, by the rankings, which are so biased towards the global north. So this data shows uh, that 81.6% of Scopus journals used by the QS and the Times Higher are based in the global north. And I should put uh, inverted commas around that. Um, so not surprisingly, when we look at the location of the top 20 uh, uh, universities ranked in the flagship Times Higher Education World University rankings, 100% um, are in the global north. However, despite their ambition to, in their own words, redefine excellence in higher education with their, their impact rankings, the Times Higher Impact rankings, um, when you looked at the location of the top 20 institutions of uh, the impact ranking, uh, the situation is barely different, uh, with the entire continents of Latin America and Africa 
I, once again with no seats at the top table. Now I should say this data is from 2023 uh, and rather interestingly after I presented this at the European University Association annual conference uh, in April 23, uh, the 2024 ranking does now have more APAC countries, uh, South Korea, Indonesia, Thailand and Malaysia in the top 20, but still none at all from Africa or Latin America. And of course, the knock-on effect here is that when this data is used by uh, policymakers, that real people are affected by this. So the use of rankings by the UK government, uh, which I mentioned earlier, to identify our high potential uh, individuals, excludes large swathes of the globe from this particular honour, so perpetuating existing inequities. So for this reason, the United Nations University International Institute for Global Health um, recently published a briefing paper exposing the rankings as a mechanism by which the concentration of power and prestige uh, among universities in the global north is maintained, uh, which is having an unhelpful influence on global health priorities. And they subsequently published a, um, a separate statement on global university rankings, which criticizes their widespread uh, and uncritical use and makes a series of recommendations for institutions seeking to use them more responsibly. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, but it's not just uh, global universities that, um, sorry, global inequities, sorry, that um, the uh, rankings exacerbate. Um, at the beginning of this of last year, actually now, um, Yale, Harvard and uh, others surprised everyone by pulling out of the US news law rankings. And then another glut of high profile institutions pulled out of the uh, US news medical school rankings, citing, amongst other things, concerns about how the ranking incentivizes schools to direct financial aid towards wealthy applicants with high test scores, which help win the rankings, rather than those with actual financial need. Uh, they felt that was unacceptable, so they withdrew. Uh, institutions now from Korea, from China, from India uh, and South Africa ha have all voted with their feet, uh, boycotting rankings on various grounds, usually protesting against some form of uh, inequity that they embed. And of course, most recently in Europe, uh, the University of Utrecht, a former top 100 institution, refused to submit data to the Times Higher uh, Education World University rankings on the basis that they place too much stress on competition, which is in direct contrast to their own focus on collaboration and open science. Of course, another dimension of fairness is not only whether certain groups are systemically uh, excluded, but whether some are getting more help than others to succeed, because rankings don't only rank institutions, but they offer consultancy, uh, data and other services to help them become more highly ranked. Uh, and in 2021, Igor Chirikov showed that universities that had such contracts with the QS rankings in this case, ultimately ended up doing much better in the rankings overall, despite no other outward signs of change to institutional quality. We see the same conflict of interest at play in the existence of the World 100 Reputation Network. So this is an exclusive club uh, open only to those who are already in the top 100, uh, willing to pay the annual 8,000 euro fee uh, and run by a company suspiciously co-located with the Times Higher, uh, whose sole purpose it is to maintain their position in the university rankings and to keep everybody else out. As tireless rankings researcher Jelena Brankovic uh, recently commented on Twitter, imagine a game of football in which a referee is also the coach of one of the teams playing. Crazy, right? You know what's crazier? The audience believing that a fair game is possible. So how might institutions respond to all this? You know, whilst I've argued that accepting the rankings as they are is an unacceptable position for the thinking university, especially one that came, claims to care about knowledge equity, I recognise that for most of us, you know, the boycotting the rankings would be tantamount to a financial and reputational suicide. So what do we do? Well, I'll tell you what we can't do. <laughs> we can't do nothing. Um, you know, if we do claim to, to care, as I say, uh, about uh, responsible assessment and knowledge equity and open data and research, <clears throat> um, if, you know, the, the rankings, uh, as we know, are systematically embedding inequities, uh, we, as I've argued, we can't turn a blind eye to this. You know, if we're not part of the solution, 
uh, ultimately we are part of the problem. Uh, and I do believe that we're entering a season now uh, where a, a, resp a university's response to the university rankings will be as much an indicator of their reputation as their position in the university rankings. So we're now actually seeing um, undergraduate students lobbying their provosts to get them to engage more critically with the university rankings. So the Uni Union of Students in Ireland um, recently passed a, a motion to lobby all Irish university leaders to cut their ties uh, with university rankings that don't meet their standards. So what can uh, in institutions do? Well, luckily, there is now a lot of advice available. Um, so Luda's already introduced the, uh, the Netherlands Ranking the University paper. Uh, so this came up with short, medium and long term recommendations at institutional, national and international level. The second um, set of guidelines was the European University Association guidelines on the use of rankings by higher education institutions. Again, 10 recommendations specifically aimed at universities. Uh, and the most recent was the United Nations University uh, International Institute for Global Health um, report, as I've mentioned earlier, providing a whole series of recommendations for a wide range of stakeholders, um, providing uh, um, uh, around three main, main themes. So I've taken uh, the liberty of summarising some of these for you um, using the Dutch University report categorisation. Um, and that is, you know, how, how we use the rankings, how we communicate about the rankings, how we collaborate with the rankings and how we might generate alternatives to the rankings, which I guess is the focus of today's event. So, so quickly, um, firstly, how might we use the rankings? Well, the key piece of advice here is that institutional decisions should not be driven by the rankings. Instead, universities should start with what they value when both developing strategy and establishing key performance indicators and other forms of internal evaluations and not what the rankings say they should value. When communicating about the rankings, the advice is, is clear uh, that universities have a duty as educators to educate uh, external stakeholders about the uses and limitations of the rankings, and particularly when it comes to students, um, to encourage them to conduct their own research to inform their university choices, rather than simply relying on ranking data, which actually largely doesn't touch on educational quality at all. Uh, and finally, where an institution does engage with a ranking, it should make it very clear why it does that, uh, i.e. what they think the ranking tells them uh, and how they are interpreting any outcome or score. Uh, when it comes to collaborating with the rankings, there's a recognition <clears throat> excuse me, that not all universities will be in a position to do this, but they might want to consider not submitting data to commercial rankers. Or if you do, as Ludo says, also make that data openly available on your website. So you're not giving your data to commercial third parties only for them to sell it back to the sector. Uh, not participating in uh, ranker reputation surveys, not purchasing ranking products and services, and not hosting or participating in commercial ranker related events. And then finally, we have alternatives to the rankings. So there's a recognition that the reason that rankings are so successful is that there is a legitimate demand for international benchmarking mechanisms for universities. We just need these to be a lot fairer and more robust than they are at the moment. And actually there are um, now you know, many alternative uh, quantitative sources, such as you multi-rank I put up here, CWTS we've already talked about, um, that really do tick a lot of boxes when it comes to responsible university assessment. Um, it's just that uh, in the case of U-Multi-Rank, they require institutions to submit data, which is something, something they're not always um, prepared to do uh, at the moment. And of course, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the other alternative or complement to uh, the quantitative um, university rankings, which all three sets of um, guidance that I previously mentioned all agreed to, <clears throat> is that all universities should sign up to uh, the iNorms More Than Our Rank uh, initiative. Uh, More Than Our Rank is uh, a relatively new initiative introduced by the iNorms Research Evaluation Group, which provides universities with an opportunity to describe in a qualitative way, you know, how much more they have to offer the world than is currently captured by the global university rankings. So a, a narrative CV for universities, if you will. 
It's early days, but we have signatories from amongst the top 100 and the yet to place. Um, and it offers really a no risk way uh, of silently exposing the rankings limitations, their narrow definition of excellence, uh, whilst not requiring institutions to boycott the rankings in any way, because you can you can love your ranking and still think that you more you're more than your rank. Uh, and what I say um, all uh, I'm even including the rankings here because the CWTS Leiden ranking uh, now actually highlights all more than our rank signatories um, and providing a, a link through to signatories uh, statements as their way of providing a qualitative complement to their quantitative assessments. Um, but it's not just uh, university owned rankings who admit that universities are more than their rank. A few months ago, Times hires Phil Beatty uh, wrote a piece highlighting 10 ways they felt uh, they had changed the ranking landscape. Uh, and number 10 was uh, clearly a direct nod to the More Than Our Rank initiative, as they stated that they know that universities are much, much more than their rank. So who knows, maybe even they will follow in the footsteps of CWTS Leiden and start surfacing institutions more than our rank statements uh, very soon. Um, I think my time is up. I hope that was a useful overview. I'm looking forward to a conversation with you. Thanks so much, Lizzie, and thanks to, to Ludo and Lizzie again for the heroic effort. It was um, 6 a.m. for Ludo, but actually 5 a.m. in the UK. So um, there's a serious dedication to the uh, international engagement um, there. So I'm going to pass over to Tim to lead the discussion. Again, um, I and Catherine are going to try and monitor the chat. Um, so if you want to place questions in the chat, please do that and I'll pass them on. Um, we do still have 140 odd people here, so it's going to be a little bit of a, a juggle. Um, but Tim, over to you. Awesome. Thank you both for those presentations. Really, really fascinating. I feel like I've uh, been around the world, not only in terms of listening to you and your geographic location, but also thinking about uh, rankings and what they mean for the universities of the world. Now, Ludo, a couple of questions cropped up from your presentation. With the cultural change that you mentioned, um, would you expect that uh, universities in the Netherlands will uh, stop collaborating with non-transparent tables soon? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. Well, one university already made that decision, as, as, as Lizzie actually mentioned, the Utrecht University, so they said this is incompatible with our commitment to open science, so we need to kind of, uh, um, uh, as a result of this commitment, we need to discontinue the participation in the Times Higher Education ranking. Uh, more broadly than that, my expectation is that in the short term, uh, most universities will not uh, feel they are able to take that step. However, it is part of the um, longer term uh, um, agenda in this, uh, in this culture change plan that has been endorsed by the universities. As part of that plan, the idea is indeed that the universities will try to get um, international um, um, support for the jointly uh, discontinuing participation in certain rankings that are considered to be problematic. And I must say, I'm of course kind of also witnessing the whole process in Netherlands from the inside. What I see now, and that's really interesting, in the implementation process of the culture change agenda, I see that the universities are actually pushing really hard for that that part of the agenda that we were proposing, the part of working together internationally and then jointly in the uh, considering steps that can be taken. So I'm actually really pleased to see that the universe have not just endorsed the advice, but are actually also really taking action. Uh, Lizzie, there um, are a couple of questions coming through the chat. Uh, one is, you know, how do we, how are we expecting that university executives and, and councils uh, that rule universities, how are we expecting them to start to take this on board? Because it's very, very difficult. It, you gave a very compelling um, uh, overview of the challenges and, and the issues at play, and yet so many are still rusted on to ranking. Yeah, it's, it's a really good question and something that the I Norms Research Evaluation Group has um, addressed actually by creating a guide and in a second I'll, I'll dig out the link. Uh, so we've got a guide for um, university administrators who uh, are keen to try and engage in this conversation with their 
um, institutional leaders. I think there's quite a lot of drivers. It really depends on what drives your institutional leader <laughs> as to how you um, try and approach this with them. You know, a lot of institutions are claiming now to care very deeply about equity and diversity and inclusion. If your institution is one of those, um, then obviously that's a significant lever because we know we've got a lot of data to show that the, the existing rankings um, are exclusive and um, unsustainable in that, that sense. Um, if your institution claims to care about, um, you know, well, I'm sure all institutions sh should claim to care about, you know, in intellectual uh, credibility, and the rankings clearly uh, do not offer us that. They do not offer us a robust way of, of assessing institutions at the moment. So I think that's another uh, a lever. Some institutions do claim to care significantly about re more responsible forms of research assessment. Um, it's, you know, it's the reason we introduce more than our rank is that we recognise that it's a huge step for institutions. As I say, you know, if particularly those who are like the Australian and, and UK institutions that uh, rely on the rankings for international recruitment, and we are dependent on international student recruitment, um, that is the only source of data really available to international students to identify uh, in institutions of quality in countries that they're, they're not familiar with. Um, so we need to supply, you know, provide alternative forms of, of data to support those um, those international uh, decision making um, and kind of, yeah, and, and to kind of engage in that um, educational process, really, to support students to make better decisions. So there's lots of um, different levers that you could use. I'll, I'll make that guide available uh, and you can read it in all its glory. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Ludo, a, a question that's come through here. I, I wanted to ask you generally why um, it's important for an organisation like BWTS to be focused on open research. And, and, and as part of that, um, there's a question come through, is the new open version um, not limited to outputs only available via open access, i.e. it may just include metadata, otherwise there would be large amounts of research output excluded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, for us, and that's really a strategic position by my, by my center, for us, the idea that not only the light ranking, but all kinds of research analytics, also research analytics that we, my center, we produce, must be based on um, open research information, so must be made fully transparent. That idea is really crucial for us. Because the all these research analysts, they have such an, an an important role in the research system. They they have so much influence on the way decisions are made. It's really essential that these these analytics meet the highest standards of openness and transparency. Um, that does indeed raise interesting questions. Um, so does that mean actually that certain things can no longer be considered? Certain outputs, perhaps, or publications can no longer be considered because they don't meet those standards of openness. But that's not exactly how it works. So um, when we look at publications, research articles, articles in scientific journals, then indeed we see that many are open access, but also uh, many are still closed, closed access. Um, the line ranking will capture both of them, both the open access and the closed access publications. And we actually will provide statistics as part of the line ranking on the, um, the number and the share of publications that are open access. Um, having said that, there is um, 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 a lot more that actually can be said about the extent to which for all these publications, the open access ones and also the closed access ones, um, the information about the publication, so-called metadata, is openly available. And there are all kinds of uh, complex differences between, for instance, publishers. Um, I won't go into details because this is really a complex space, but I do want to say that our data source that we use, Open Alex, is making an attempt to be as comprehensive as possible. They, for instance, also um, for purposes that are kind of not really behaving as good citizens that don't properly make metadata openly available, they just scrape the publisher websites. It's not perfect, but it's the best we have at the moment. Um, and in that way, we are also trying to incorporate publications that are not themselves open access. Are you concerned, Ludo, just on that then, that, that you will get a pushback, that it will be seen as a, a, even though the existing rankings, the other rankings using traditional uh, closed data sources are also incomplete, are you concerned that you will get pushback about this ranking? Um, 
Well, what you see globally is is in the in the in the academic system is a really widespread commitment to open science, open research. So I think any university that is kind of um, 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 indeed uh, using that whole narrative about open science and the importance of of that should naturally also embrace developments like like this one. I do think that um, um, universities will raise legitimate questions about. For instance, the extent to which the data that we use, the data that is indeed open, the extent to which the data also in other respects, other respects than the openness, has a level of quality that is comparable to what we used in the past. And, and these types of concerns are legitimate, and, and we will try to be as transparent as possible about, about these kinds of questions. What I also hope is that actually by being transparent, by having this conversation together, this conversation about, for instance, data quality, we will jointly be able to uh, to make the improvements that may still need to be made, and also, if necessary, to actually identify the actors in the system that are not yet actually um, um, taking their responsibility in in um, uh, facilitating openness of research information, like indeed certain certain publishers. Uh, Lizzie, um, is there a concern that this new open ranking might have similar results and and? If they're similar, are, are we still running into the same issues? Because it is a rankings and you know a new form of rankings system, but still a a rankings problem, if you like. Yeah, I I, I mean I'm I'm not a huge <laughs> as you can probably tell I'm not a huge fan of of any university ranking because um, I I just don't really feel like any university actually needs to be ranked at the end of the day. Um, you know, I think we do need to rank where there's where there's limited resource, where you when you've got um one job on offer, one prize, a limited amount of um research funding, then you need to rank um the entities applying for that 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 source of um prize, that prize if you like. But in terms of um you know uh, educational quality and um research quality what what universities have to have have to offer it's not a zero sum game everyone can win everyone can win at the, the game that they are playing and you know we assume that we are you know we are all largely in the the same game but we're all we are and we aren't you know there's there's d different things that we're trying to do uh, as institutions um and you know but, but i think w one of my main issues with rankings is that the data is so uh, unreliable um not reliable enough to be used um confidently used in in it, to to actually rank institutions um so cwts as i say is one of the, the best of the bunch because they do um kind of declare the error in their their data as much as they can um and they do um obviously are now kind of using open data sources i think you know as ludo's kind of said it looks like there, there is largely going to be similarities between ranking positions uh, particularly i would guess at the top end of the ranking um because inequities in the data um are symptomatic of larger inequities in the scholarly ecosystem right you know and and, and whilst we can and we should practice what we preach and use open and inclusive data and you know chapeau to CWTS Leiden for for doing this and I love the incidentally I love the way that CWTS has done this in that they've not run the data first and then decided to use it they first made the principal decision to use the data and then they ran it you know they then ran their analysis um you know but so so whilst we can and should uh, practice what we preach here and use these open and inclusive data sources, we must also seek to address those larger inequities in parallel, which are going to affect any data source closed or open. I've just got a follow up question for you, Lizzie, on, on that. Uh, there is a question come through about saying my university does not currently participate in rankings, but considering starting. Imagine mm. that you're you're at you know, that university, you've seen that there's a new open ranking and you also know the deficiencies in the others. How are you going to feel recommending focusing on one or two new rankings when you know all the rest of Australia's universities are probably focused on all the others? Yeah, I mean, yeah, when I saw that question come through, um, my advice was going to be <laughs> make a feature of not participating, you know. Um, 
you know, we do need to monitor these rankings. They are affecting um, the, the, the decisions that are being made about engagement with our institutions. So we cannot be ignorant of what they're saying about our institutions. So we do need to monitor them. We don't need to trumpet their, their findings. We don't need to submit data to them. Um, if we can avoid it, we don't need to, um, you know, as, as I've mentioned, attend, attend their buy their data, attend their events and uh, market, market um, them for, for them. Um, we, uh, you know, I would encourage uh, institutions in that situation to um, engage with more than our rank, to explain to the world, you know, how much more they do have to offer than the rankings um, cur currently kind of um, surface. Um, but I think, you know, if, if you're... Um, trying to seeking to justify using an alternative um, ranking system I think you know you've got, you've got to think why, why is my institution doing this you know the way that most universities will justify ranking uh, analyst posts is that ranking data helps universities understand its relative performance in the world but if that institution really does care about its relative performance in the world it really should be <laughs> using a ranking that uses a data set that better represents that world right and, and that's what CWTS Leiden uh, the, the open um, ranking is seeking to do um, so, so that's that's an argument um, the others as I say are around you know if your institution does have ambitions around EDI and around responsible assessment assessment about open research you know there, there really is no excuse for sp spending significant amounts of time uh, analyzing rankings that do not adhere to the prin those principles that you care about you know so I think um, it, it's hard for administrators to to make that argument and they certainly can't make that decision for the institution but they can um, support their leaders in showing some leadership in this space um, and making some principled decisions about what, what they do, how they engage with rankings and to, to promote that leadership. You know, so I, I want to give a big shout out whilst I'm here to uh, Queensland University of Technology, who has engaged with more than our rank, um, that has been very vocal. So Adrian Barnett, one of the professors there, been very vocal about, um, you know, with... with um, more critical engagement with the university rankings. So there's there's institutions that are really um, engaging responsibly in this space. And as I say, I do genuinely believe that going forward, we will be judged on you know how we engage with the rankings um, rather than how we are ranked. Ludo, back to you. Um, is this the first time that we've had a ranking that can be replicated? And if so, uh, this, that's a pretty significant thing for the world. Yeah, to the best of my knowledge, the answer to that question is, is yes. Um, so the Leiden ranking, the open edition will indeed be fully reproducible. Um, um, so that is actually not only, for instance, about openness of the, uh, the data, but it's also about, for instance, all the source code of the algorithms being fully open. Um, which also for my team is actually a big, um, uh, big effort that they are making, a big commitment. But we really feel we need to make that commitment. It's part of the responsibility we have to do all of this responsibly. Um, to my knowledge, there are no other university ranks that have reached uh, that level of of, of transparency. Um, so in that sense, I I really feel we are reaching a milestone. It's not easy to get there, but it's crucial that we all make these efforts. And, and what does this mean for the future of the Leiden ranking, Ludo? Um, uh, yeah, wh where do you go from here? Yeah, so what I mentioned in, in, in my talk, I said, this is an experiment. And, and I'm mentioning that because I want to, and I, I realized that some people, some organizations actually make decisions based on the statistics we, we publish and, I feel at the moment organizations should be a little bit cautious in the way they are going to use the statistics we are going to release because this is all kind of well a new thing we haven't done before a new type of data etc and it's not going to be perfect immediately right now so that's why I was a little bit cautious in the way I sent this and I said this is an experiment however the commitment is clear the commitment to making the full transition to open research information that's the commitment we are making so we will end up there in one or two at most three years we will make sure to end up there one way or the other 
And that means that the traditional line ranking, the one based on web science data, that one is going to be discontinued. We don't know yet when exactly. That depends on actually the outcomes of this experiment, what we'll learn from it, how it will be received. But um, at some point in the coming years, the traditional web of science based line ranking will be discontinued. Is it challenging for for you at CWTS to take the decision to, um, to you know to say you, you know don't don't use our data for your strategy, don't use our our um, our ranking for your measurement? Is that was that difficult to make that decision? No. Um, so the mission of my center is actually contribute to making the research system better. So from that point of view, this is not difficult to say because this is actually fully aligned with that mission. Um, so rather than actually kind of advising universities to make decisions on data that actually might not yet meet the standards of rigor and reliability that we feel are necessary, it's actually much more in line with our mission to actually um, be part of a bigger conversation in which we actually work together to reach the levels of rigor that we need. Um, uh, rigor combined, of course, with openness. Lizzie, is it uh, difficult uh, to juggle the the competing needs? We have um, an obvious uh, push to move towards a more intelligent, thoughtful use of rankings. At the same time, the university being number one in a given ranking is a very simple marketing slogan that pulls in millions, if not billions of pounds, dollars, et cetera. Um, how, do, how do we juggle that? Is, there, is it a battle between the CFO and somebody else? You know, how are universities going to actually deal with that in reality? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is a challenge, um, but it's not an impossible one to engage with, and it's going to involve a lot of small shifts. Um, and the, the expression that I use internally when talking about this stuff is that we do, we have to play the game because the, the game is here, it's live, we're in it, there's winners and losers every year. We need to keep the lights on, right? You know, we have to recruit those students, um, and that's a major source of income for many um, institutions in the UK and uh, Australia and around the world, of course. Um, but we also have to change the game, you know, if, if we are, it comes back to our intellectual credibility as, as institutions, as a university, going back to Stephen Curry's point, you know, if you're, if you need a, univer a university ranking to tell you what matters, are you really a university, you know, this, this goes down to first principles um, of university -ing. you know, we have to be thinking, we have to be critical thinkers, and we can't, Look these rankings in the eye and, and legitimize them um, uncritically. We have to um, kind of both play and change the game. Um, and that's, as I say, to not to keep harking on about more than our rank, but that is why we introduced that to provide that um, small stepping stone for institutions to say, well, we, you know, we can't afford to boycott the rankings um, and some might not even want to, but we can all agree that every institution from Yale and Harvard down to those who are not yet ranked or, or made visible at all by the university rankings, we are all so much more than our rank and even the rankings are saying that, you know, as what Phil Beatty's <laughs> blog post uh, admitted uh, uh, itself, you know, we recognise that every institution in the world is much, much more than its rank. So we'd all agreed on this. We're all agreed that every institution is more than, than a single digit. We can't be reduced to a single digit on, a, on a, a ranking, which claims to identify the best universities in the world. We all know this. So we need to start making small steps uh, and uh, away from <laughs> the, the, those sorts of assessments um, and towards you know, better forms of assessment, which is you know, where CWTS Leiden's um, work and Koki's work comes to the fore, but because we can't move away from something unless there's something to move to. Um, because we, as I say, there is a legitimate need for data around um, university performance. It's just that what we have in the university rankings is not providing anything that's anywhere near good enough. Uh, it doesn't measure what matters to us as institutions. It doesn't measure that in a responsible and robust way. And it has hugely perverse uh, consequences. I'm going to was going to say unintended consequences, but they're 
<laughs> it may well be intended consequences because these are commercial organizations and they are going to do things that drive us back into their arms. Um, so we just have to be aware of that as critical thinking institutions uh, and start agreeing together how we are going to work to, to do this better. So interesting. Um, I feel like I could keep asking questions for some time, but Cameron, I'm aware of the time. Um, did you have some comments to close off? Um, I, I, before I uh, stop talking, I would love to say, um, Ludo and Lizzie, your contributions have been uh, enlightening and absolutely fascinating um, this afternoon. So um, on behalf of Future Campus, thank you very much. Cameron, over to you. Hey, thanks, Tim. Um, and yeah, could I just echo um, that comment um, again? I know I'm, I know I'm harping on time zones, and those of us who work across international boundaries spend a long time, a lot of our time, harping on about time zones. Um, but uh, not only had two of the world's leading experts and, and major change makers, um, but they have got up heroically early in the morning uh, to speak to us. Um, so thank you both uh, for that. Um, I would simply like to thank everyone else for attending. Um, again, speaking to the time zone issue, I appreciate it's um, past 5 p.m. on a Friday afternoon, at least in some states um, in Eastern Australia. Um, and so with that in mind, uh, we will have a follow-up webinar on the 31st of January, um, further collaboration between Future Campus and Koki the day after. Um, the uh, open edition is released, again, time zones. Um, and um, we look forward to talking more about the, the concrete aspects of the results then. Um, but in the meantime, thank you. Have a good evening. Have a good weekend. Um, and good luck with everything that's coming our way in the Australian HE sector in 2024.